Welcome back to Exercise Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff, and please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss a quantity in exercise physiology called the respiratory quotient, or RQ. Respiratory quotient, RQ, is defined mathematically as the volume of exhaled carbon dioxide divided by the volume of inhaled oxygen. But to understand this really, we should look at the equation for uh, complete catabolism of glucose from cell respiration, and you probably saw this all the way back in general biology. If we take a molecule of glucose, we'd have to consume six molecules of oxygen, but we'd get out six molecules of carbon dioxide and six waters. We don't care about the waters. Now, because this is stoichiometrically accurate to say that for every one molecule of glucose, we're going to consume six molecules of oxygen and produce six molecules of CO2. Instead of worrying about these volumes, we can actually just plug in some numbers. We can actually plug in the stoichiometric coefficients. So for VCO2, I can use the coefficient six from carbon dioxide, plug that in, in the numerator. And then for VO2, I can actually use the coefficient for oxygen, which is 6, and 6 divided by 6 is obviously 1.0 or just 1. Now, what this tells me is that if I were if I were a cell and I were solely metabolizing glucose, and really you consider it the whole body, if you were metabolizing completely glucose and nothing else, and you measured somebody's respiratory quotient, it should be exactly 1 having no contributions from any other fuel source such as fat, for example, which we'll actually look at in a minute. Now, in reality, we're really not going to get values of exactly one. We'd have to be at a very, very, very high exercise intensity, probably around 100% our VO2 max or even a supra maximal beyond that to get an RQ of one. Under normal exercise conditions, we're not going to have an RQ of one. Respiratory quotient is a good predictor of what fuel source is contributing to energy production during steady state exercise. And the key is that the exercise has to be in steady state. And just remember what that means is that from the body's perspective, a uh, whole body that is, all the energy that's being produced, as in like ATP, is being balanced by the ATP that's being consumed. And when you satisfy that condition, more or less, you're in steady state exercise. So pretty much that just means your intensity is constant, okay? You'd have to be completely consuming every ATP that you produce and so on and so forth. Now, in all reality, the respiratory quotients that we're actually going to measure in a lab are going to be somewhere between 1 and 0 0.7, okay? And why is this 0 0.7? Well, this number actually comes from fatty acid metabolism. So now, forget the glucose for a second, forget carbohydrate, we're only going to look at fatty acid metabolism. So let's play the same game we did with glucose. Let's look at cell respiration, but do it for a fatty acid. Now, this is not the only fatty acid. There are others such as myristic acid, which is 14 carbons, stearic acid, which is 18 carbons. We're going to look at palmitic acid, which is a 16 carbon fatty acid, the most common fatty acid, also called palmitate. And it turns out that to completely catabolize palmitate, uh, through beta oxidation and other pathways, it requires 23 molecules of oxygen, and you get out 16 molecules of carbon dioxide and 16 molecules of water. And if we play the same game we did up here with the coefficients and plugging them into the equation, we can take the coefficient for carbon dioxide 16, plug that in for VCO2. We can also take the coefficient for oxygen, which is 23, plug that in for VO2 into the denominator, and if we would divide this out, it's not going to be exactly 0.7, but it's going to be around 0.7, approximately. If we took any other fatty acids, such as myristate, myristic acid, or stearic acid, or capric acid, anything, these numbers are going to change a little bit, but the overall quotient is going to be about the same. It's going to be around 0.7. And if we had a situation where a person during exercise was exclusively metabolizing fatty acids, then their RQ that we measure is going to be about 0.7. Now again, just as in the case of we really never have somebody who's solely metabolizing glucose, we're never going to have someone who's solely metabolizing fatty acids. It's going to be a value somewhere between 0.7 and 1. And that's because during really any exercise intensity other than complete maximal or super maximal, uh, you're going to have some percent contribution from both fuel sources. 
And we've talked about this in other videos where we talk about the crossover effect or how fuel source changes with exercise intensity. If you want to see more information on that, go watch those videos, which I have included in this playlist. For example, let's consider 50% of our VO2 max. We look at 50% where my mouse is, we see that both carbohydrate and fat both contribute to energy production during exercise. So for example, at 50% of VO2 max, carbohydrates in blue actually contribute a slightly higher percentage than fat. Carbohydrates are going to consider, contribute about 60%, whereas fat's going to only contribute about 40%, but they both contribute. And in a case like that, we would have an RQ that's between 0.7 and 1. Now, because carbohydrates appear to contribute a greater percentage than fat at 50% VO2 max, our RQ is going to be closer to 1 than it is 0.7, but it's not going to be 1 and it's not going to be 0.7. It's going to be somewhere in between these two values. If we look at a very low exercise intensity, such as 10% of VO2 max, which might as well be at rest, we have a higher degree or higher percent contribution to energy production from fat than we do carbohydrate. But we still have contributions from both. In that case, again, we're still going to have an RQ between 0.7 and 1, but this one we might expect to be closer to 0.7 than it is 1 because at 10% VO2 max, we have a much higher percent contribution from fat. Okay, and so ultimately, there's two things you should get from this video. One is that the respiratory quotient is a great predictor of the contribution uh, from different fuel sources to exercise, that is steady state exercise. And number two, you can look at the value of RQ to actually determine what the fuel source predominantly might be. If I measured somebody's RQ in the lab and it came out to be 0.9, that's fairly close to 1. It's closer to 1 than it is 0.7. And so an RQ of 0.9 would probably indicate to me that it's a fairly high exercise intensity because... At high exercise intensities, that's where we have a higher degree or percent contribution from carbohydrate than we do fat. If I measured someone's RQ in the lab and it was 0.75, that would tell me that the exercise intensity is fairly low. Uh, because if it's closer to 0.7, which is indicative of fatty acid metabolism exclusively, 0.75, let's say, that means we have a higher degree of fatty acid metabolism than carbohydrate, which indicates a low exercise intensity. All right, so hopefully this video made some sense to you and cleared some stuff up about the RQ and what it means. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. And we're gonna look at some more aspects of exercise physiology in the next videos. Thank you.